more and more indicators are coming in that suggest that the economy is slowing down. And uh, some of these indicators suggest that a recession might be on the horizon. So I want to start with uh, a story that that came out today that the the U.S. Treasuries, the two year and the 10 year bond, the yield curve inverted. And historically, the inversion on the two and the 10 year notes is a very reliable indicator of a recession. In fact, every recession in the last 60 years has been preceded by that kind of a yield inversion. Uh, the, the qualifier is that not every inversion has been followed by a recession, but every recession has been preceded by that kind of an inversion. So it's certainly a red flag. It's certainly an indicator that that something uh, is a muck. So when you're looking at the economy right now, and, and I'm sure you've seen some things that are in line with the stuff that I've seen, uh, what's, what's your feeling on, on where things are headed right now? We're headed for an interest in next 12 to 24 months, I believe. So a lot of people I've been talking to lately are kind of in the holding pattern right now. Uh, prices on just about everything in our life, right? We've talked about this before. Uh, reports are saying inflation is 8%, 7%. And if you go talk to anybody that you know lives in the real world, we believe it's closer to 15 or 20%. Um, if you've bought groceries, if, if you've purchased a house, if you've purchased car insurance, 8% just isn't what it is. <laughs> so um, our, the, the price point across the board on all these industries have gotten so high, I think we're finally reaching the point where people are saying, well, we're going we're gonna to just get in a holding pattern here and we're not going to buy any more investments because we want to see what happens. Um, I don't know if it's imminent, I, you know, they're kind of batting down the hatches. They're, they're, they're saying, well, let's, let's get out of debt as much as possible. Let's make sure we're not over leveraged. Uh, let's take a look at our whole outlook and uh, let's just see what happens here in the next 12 to 24 months. So I, I, I hear and see a lot of that in the past 30 days. And right. every week that goes by, that's what I'm hearing more of right now. Well, that's, that's in line with why this sort of a yield curve inversion is a significant indicator. So what that really means when you hear that is that the interest rate on a two-year note is higher than the interest rate on a 10-year note. Well, why would that be? You know, if if I was going to borrow money from you, you would want a higher interest rate to loan me that money for 10 years because you're going to be without it for a longer period of time. The compensation for me borrowing that money should theoretically be higher the longer I borrow. But in fact, what, what has happened is that the interest rate on the short-term bond, it went higher than the long term. So that indicates that people are expecting an economic slowdown. And it's that exact sentiment that you talked about that you're hearing in, you know, real estate and in other areas economically that people are thinking, well, you know, maybe I'm not going to see a big return anymore. Maybe I should slow down and take a step back before I get really heavily involved in more projects because things might take a turn for the worse, you know, and you don't want to get caught over leveraged and you don't want to get caught holding the bag, having paid more for something than it's worth. So I think that, that what you're hearing is dovetailing very nicely with some of the economic indicators that we're seeing from the data. And uh, of course, 
to me that suggests that that there might actually be something to this you know if if you're hearing reports that don't match the reality of what you're seeing out in the world then that's cause for you know skepticism but when when the data is matching your real world experience i think that that that's a more powerful indicator that the data might be right and you know there are some other things going on that that suggest that uh, maybe there might be some dark clouds on the horizon. Uh, I know that when we were talking before the show, you'd mentioned uh, home sales and how they've kind of taken a slowdown. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what you've seen there? Yeah, so uh, the sales of uh, of homes in uh, the state of Florida and nationally, ha- the numbers are down uh, in January and February again. And uh, those both those months have been reported they've been released and they're down considerably march's numbers obviously aren't out yet but they have been trending downward also so we expect uh them to be all they could be off as high as 10 percent um we are seeing a little bit of an inventory issue that contributes a little bit to that but it's it's not the 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 big uh, factor there and not only that, auto sales are down. So there's a, the other big industry, you know, that, that we try to track. Um, January was lower than December and February was lower than January. So um, when you start to see more and more sectors be down uh, month over month, that's usually a telltale sign that something's coming, like you say. Well, those two markets in particular are significant. You know, one of the recurring themes that we talk about on this program is kind of the big three. And when it comes to household spending, the overwhelming amount of a family's budget goes to the big three. That would be housing costs, either in terms of mortgage or rent, transportation costs, so what you pay in gas prices and what you pay if you finance your vehicle, and then your groceries and your, you know, household consumables. Well, when you're seeing home sales slowing down and you're seeing vehicles slowing down, those are significant sectors in the economy. And when you're looking for indicators as to how well the economy is performing, how healthy it is, how much it's either growing or or perhaps uh, how much it's not growing. Those are significant indicators that, that people look at. If the economy is doing well, typically the housing market is booming. And obviously you talked about there being supply issues. Well, there, there are supply issues with autos and with houses, but over the last 18 months, all that has meant is that prices have been going up. People exactly. have still been buying. Well, now they're starting to pump the brakes on, on that activity. And maybe it's because prices have just gotten so high that that people don't feel like there's a return on that on that spending. Uh But part of it may also be that people are anticipating an economic slowdown and they don't want to take on significant a significant debt burden uh, right before a recessionary environment kicks in. And this kind of goes back to what we've talked about with the Federal Reserve and kind of incrementally trying to raise interest rates to tamp down inflation. Um, The theory is that as interest rates go up, lending goes down. As lending goes down, spending decreases. And as spending decreases, the economy contracts. So the fear is, is that if the Fed raises interest too quickly or too high, that it's going to lead to a, uh, an economic recession. I think people are looking at that, and, and part of this may be that they're factoring that in. Uh, part of it may be that 
you just kind of get to a point where prices have gotten so high that people can't they can no longer say yes i will pay that much yep. you know i just can't yep. afford it anymore yep. and uh that's that's one of the risks that happens in an inflationary environment because the longer that inflation goes on the the more that it takes a hit on the real wages that someone is earning you know if if i'm an employer and i give my employees a five percent raise but inflation is at eight percent well the the real impact on their wages is a three percent annual decrease in their earning power so that means that they are actually less well off than they were before well, the longer that kind of thing goes on, obviously, the more people get into a situation where their earnings and the earning power is decreasing, well, then they really have to start making some serious choices about what they choose to spend their money on because they don't have as much expendable income as they did before. So that sort of thing, I think, is is one of the contributors to the boom and the bust cycle that we continually experience in our economy. Every so often, you're going to get the bust. And it just may be that we're getting to the time where that bust is is closer than maybe it has been for some time. So that's the way I read things. Um, what about you, Psyche? What are you thinking? Well, I'll tell you what comes to mind for me, and I agree with you 100%. But if you look at the, the, let's just take real estate, for example, because we've had such a uptick in activity buying and selling, but even buying, because if you're selling, typically you got to buy. Well, home prices are up, let's say 25%. Let's say you had a house that was $200,000 and um, it's actually probably up more than that in most areas, but a a $200,000 house is probably selling for $300,000 or better. So you're looking at a, a 50% and sometimes 100% increase over three to four years ago. I'm not talking 15 years ago. I'm talking three to four years ago. So that's all relatively new. Obviously, pay has gone up, not quite at that level. So um, we, you know, when you factor a few items in, you got such an increase in the real estate prices. Pay has gone up a little bit. The average household has more subscription-based items they pay for on a monthly basis now than we've ever had. And then you start to raise interest rates because we think it's going to help curb inflation. You know, I'm not that smart, so I don't know if it will or won't. Time will tell. I'm not going to predict that part of it. But we've just increased the cost of a house. So, it, you know, you might as well. I mean, I was talking to someone today and instead of four and a quarter percent, they're getting six percent. Well, that's one and three quarter percent difference. I mean, you might as well jump that three hundred thousand dollar house to three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So over the, the course of a 30 year mortgage, it's going to cost you a lot of money. So. That actually got me thinking about how cash plays into that right so does that make the like for real estate or the auto loans or anything that's a bigger purchase does that actually make cash more attractive because you have an edge on someone who has to borrow that money and it costs them more over the long run well, that's a good question i mean i i think that you can make an argument that you should always have a certain amount of your assets in cash because of the liquidity i mean it, it when you have cash you can spend it right then and right there you don't have to wait to convert one asset into cash so that then you can go purchase something else but <clears throat> it's hard to say how much you know you should keep um i'm not i'm not personally a super big fan of cash right now because inflation is so high yeah. i i think 
that I've been hanging around you long enough that it's starting <laughs> to rub off. Um, I, I really believe right now that it's a good idea to sit on the sidelines for a little while. I mean, you and I've been looking for deals now for quite some time when it comes to real estate, when it comes to perhaps purchasing a business, things of that nature. And, you know, you and I have, have laughed over and over again because you are an extraordinarily picky consumer. <laughs> you know, you're, you're like the guy at the plate, you know, the batter at the plate, and you are waiting for that 95 mile an hour fastball right at the letters so that you can crank it out of the park. And if you don't get that pitch, you're going to let it pass. And so I'm looking at the market right now and I'm thinking, well, you know, that's, that's actually not bad. You probably want to wait until you get the perfect pitch or you just want to take it right now because I think if if the indicators are accurate and if a recession is on the way in the next year or two, that's going to provide an opportunity to pick up, you know, the, the old adage that you and I both love is sell high and buy low and then buy low and sell high. Yeah. Well, Right now, if you buy, you're going to be buying high. If you wait a couple of years until the economy has, has gone into a bit of a recession and maybe prices start to come back down a little bit. And, and I understand that economic growth and prices are not perfectly correlated. But when there is a recession, a lot of times what tends to happen is that people who are over leveraged can no longer finance their debt. They can no longer pay their bills. And so you see foreclosures, you see fire sales in terms of some assets so that people can get out of whatever debt they're in. And so that gives you an opportunity to buy assets for lower than market, as opposed to paying at or slightly above market. And I think that's the environment that that we're in right now. So I advise waiting a little while, whether you're sitting on cash or whether you're sitting on, you know, gold or you're sitting on something else, um, whatever that that might be that you're comfortable in. Obviously, you got to keep some cash, but you know, just wait for the right opportunity. And if you got to wait two years for the right opportunity, I do think that the opportunities are going to come. So patience, I think, is is the course that I would preach right now. Yep. And I agree with the patience aspect of that 100 percent and just about everything else you said. Um, they the numbers just don't add up, you know, looking at it from an investment angle, um, you know, and, and I'm talking strictly on the real estate side, you know, when it comes to the cryptocurrency world and the stock market, that's for me, my principles are a lot longer uh, time frame on that. So that still makes sense. If you're, you're going to continue to dollar cost average, you know, put some in every week or every month or whatever your system is. But on the real estate side, I, I've, uh, I'm the flip side of that is I'm seeing people that are getting impatient, you know, the the savvy investor or I should I, I should say experienced investor is the one are the ones that are telling me you we need to sit on the sidelines and wait like you just stated but I see some you know younger newer investors that are just chomping at the bit to get in the game right now and that's when you get hurt the most is when you get your emotions involved and you feel like you just need to get in because you're missing out that fear of missing out right um but when you just take emotions out of it and i just did it today for several people with several people the numbers just do not add up and if you can't be cash flow positive on a property if you're taking out a loan you don't need to buy that property <laughs> so 
it's pretty simple. <laughs> it is. I mean, because if, if you're not cash flow positive right now, what happens when the recession does come and people can't exactly. afford the, the vacation rental or whatever the case may be, you know, then you're really going to be hurting because the difference between what you're spending and what you're earning is going to come out of your pocket. Yeah, Robert yeah. Kiyosaki, I, I read a book from him a long time ago, probably back in the late 90s, early 2000s. And he made the statement that, you know, if if I buy a house with somebody else's money and it nets me $5 a month in the worst time, he said, how many of them houses can I buy? And the answer is infinite amount. If, if you're generating $5, well, as much as the bank will loan you. And, right. you know, whether or not that's smart or not is a totally different <laughs> conversation for another day. But he then said, well, if I use other people's money and I'm paying $5 a month for each house out of my pocket because it doesn't cover it, well, how many houses can I buy then? And obviously the number changes. Well, how much free cash flow do you have in your ordinary budget from your income, your day job every month? So it becomes a whole different ball game then. It does. And and you definitely have to factor in future expectations when yeah. when you're getting in. I mean, that's that's why buying low makes so much sense, right? Because yeah. you're you're getting in before the boom, and the boom is when you're really going to make a lot of money, both on the cash flow side and the valuation of the assets. The Purposeful Podcast.